Welcome to ATBS, the podcast, all things big and small. I'm your host, Jeff Volmerich. My guest today is a former member of USA Gymnastics Women's National Team and a nine-time NCAA Gymnastics All-American. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Exercise and Sports Science, a Bachelor of Science degree in Psychology, and a Master of Science degree in Nutritional Biochemistry and Metabolism. My guest is Shannon Doliak, and on her website, it says, giving attention to each of the seven pillars of peak performance puts us in a position to perform at our best and fuels our ability to accomplish the untapped. Shannon is the owner of Primal Peak. The goal of Primal Peak is to serve as a resource for those looking to improve their health through nutrition and lifestyle choices. Check her out at primalpeak.com. Shannon and I had a wonderful conversation. We talk about the seven pillars of peak performance. I hope you enjoy it. Shannon, welcome to the pod ship. Thanks for coming back. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. This is our second go at the seven pillars of peak performance. And I don't mind saying that as I'm learning this craft, We had some leveling issues and things like that. So fortunately, I have a couple of guests that are willing to come back and and do it again. So thank you very much. Absolutely. It was so much fun the first time. Let's do it again. Do it again. Yeah. So today we're here to talk about the seven pillars of peak performance that are a part of your primalpeak.com package and, and project. What would you call primal peak so that I have the terminology right? Primal peak started as a nutrition focused, um, both blog and one-on-one consulting or coaching business. And, you know, over time working with clients and through my own experience, I realized that there was more to health than just nutrition. I've known, you know, for a while that fitness is important, the mind is important. Those three areas have been on my radar from the time I was pretty young. But I also realized there were some other elements there. So that's where the seven pillars came from. And those seven pillars are some areas that I started working with, um, with my clients beyond nutrition. Seems like you've been working on those, uh, whether you identified them or not, when you were a gymnast and put them all into practice at one level or another. Yeah, absolutely. They were each essential to, you know, the success that I had and just the process along the way. When I think back, I can pick out just fun stories, fun, you know, memories that apply to each of the seven pillars. That'll be fun as we yeah. go through. Mm-hmm. Um, so primalpeak.com is is a growing project. It, it really seems like a project, right? It's a there's a website, of course, and that's where you go find everything that Shannon is doing, but it's a it's a growing project. It's a growing project. It started out online too as mostly a recipe resource for people that were interested in an in ancestral way of eating. So really looking at what the earth offers us for food. And that came to be because people would ask me, what do you and your family eat? And they wanted specifics. Yeah, right. So I started to share specifically what we ate. And, you know, it has morphed. There's more life content on there. So it's, you know, far beyond just a recipe site now. Oh, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah, so there's a ton on. of information there. There is. And, you know, it's been fun. I, I enjoy that process of writing and sharing. So it's been fun to dive in on the site and get that information out there and it continues to evolve. Yeah, fantastic. There's a lot that I think we can dive into that we maybe didn't even get to the last time, but the seven pillars. Yeah, seven pillars. They are mind, body, food, nature, play, people, and rest. I love the fact that mind is number one. And and I think maybe I was looking at the list earlier thinking, Oh, should we put rest at the beginning? I think people put rest at the end, right? Not just because it's at the end of the list, but it's at the end of the day. So we'll get to that. One of the quotes in your Primal Peak project is, uh, mindfulness is a mindset and meditation is the training to achieve it. Gustavo Rossetti, that's his quote. And I think when we talk about the mind, I'd, I'd love to hear, I like we all have this, our own perception of what that means. What does it mean to you and, and what have you learned and, and how do you view it? I have learned that the mind, I believe, is our most powerful tool. As a young gymnast, I definitely started to use 
my mind and see the benefit of the power of positive thinking and how that could help me not only get through training, but perform better, see myself in a, in a better light. And for me, the first part of mind was mindset, understanding, grasping the concept of mindset. And, and I think, you know, it's about our attitudes, our beliefs towards a situation. And the way I like to think of it is, is my glass half empty or is my glass half full? Right. A classic. Classic. And that visualization for me just works. Worked back then. It works today. So setting your mind in a positive direction really sets you up, I think, for making the most of a situation. Mindfulness to me is really being present. It's really about the here and the now. And that's easy to say. It's hard to do. Sure is. It really is. And I think that, you know, we spend so much time in the past, which can often be depressive, or we're reaching out towards the future, and that can often create anxiety. And when you're able to take some deep breaths and bring yourself into that present moment, into your own body, into your own space, it really does bring a sense of calm across. And that mindfulness. I think is practiced through meditation, or you could call it visualization. There's a misconception about meditation that it has to be something that is very, it's very exact. It's very- You have to be sitting and you have to be in the right mudra and om, right? It's not, it doesn't have to be that. It doesn't have to be that. It doesn't have to be clarity of mind. Like, you know, some people think I can't think when I'm meditating. Well, that's not true. Or right, good luck with thinking. that. <laughs> so um, as an athlete, we often did visualization exercises and you know, you're picturing the perfect gymnastics routine. You're picturing, you're feeling, you're imagining yourself at the high level gymnastics meet and how you're going to perform. And when the time comes to, to go and do that performance, then you're reminding yourself, I've been there, I've done this, and you let your body go and and perform. Mm. And so when I started meditating, I was listening to guided meditations and realizing that it was very similar to- Deep relaxation and preparation for visualization, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, And so I, I would encourage anyone to experiment, have fun, play with that concept, to just tune into the mind, tune into the power that's in there. I think tuning in is a really key piece of the puzzle because I think we tune out, like we tune outwardly. We don't tune out necessarily, but outwardly, we're in tune outwardly and it can be really challenging for people. And that's why it's called a practice to sit with self and feel. How do I feel? Am I agonizing over something that I did do or didn't do or didn't do as well as I'd like in the past? Or am I anxious about something that's going to happen in the future. And it's challenging to go in very worthwhile. And it doesn't take a lot of time just to, oh, how do I feel today? And what am I thinking? And great benefit to it. And I think the other thing that people do is they think that needs to be a certain amount of time. If they're going to meditate or they're going to get into a deeply relaxed state and get into some breathing, it can be 10 deep breaths where All you do is focus on that. And that takes what? That takes about two minutes or three minutes or something. And and, oh, how much better you feel. Yeah. Even starting and ending the day that way can have great benefit. Great thing to do. And then, you know, for people who sit at desks or, or, you know, sit at work, get up and, and do that a few times, you know, a number of times a day. Somebody said to me the other day, I forget who I was talking to, asked somebody, do, do people still stand around the water cooler at work, right? Like it'd be a place to do it. Right. I was in a yoga workshop. That's where it was. And, and you can practice standing, right, in a very powerful, in your power and in an anatomically balanced position. And no one will know the difference except they'll look at you and think, wow, you look good today. Right. Versus being all hunched over. And so you can practice it. You can practice throughout the day, pretty much anywhere. Yeah, anywhere, anytime. Uh, I think the the breath work is key. It's a great place to start. Yeah, because it is intimidating, right? I, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to just socially where they're like, oh, Jeff, you're doing all these things and I've tried and I can't. And of course we can. Absolutely. But you get, it's it's a little, I, I liken it a little bit too when I first walked into a yoga studio. It's intimidating. 
you were saying before we turned on the microphones that you were, I am assuming you were at CrossFit this morning and, and big workout and, and, you know, you were in it and got in the pain cave. And like, for me, I've never walked into a CrossFit gym. Mm -hmm. It would be intimidating. Right. And things like that, it's, that's the unknown, right? What we don't know, we can easily become intimidated and kind of resist. Uh, it's maybe better to lean in and give it a go. Yep. One of my favorite parts of teaching CrossFit when I was doing that was welcoming those people, those beginners, the newbies into the gym and helping them get across that barrier and feel comfortable because it can be very intimidating to very do something intimidating. new. And I know for a fact that there are people around town when I've said, I, I've said, oh, well, I did a, a, a podcast episode with Shannon and, and uh, they're like, oh, geez, those guys are ripped, right? Like you, <laughs> you and your husband are well known for being in the CrossFit gym. And so maybe I'll take, maybe when I get back from my river <laughs> trip, go. I'll be like, can I come and be the beginner newbie guy? <laughs> So mind and mindfulness and mindset meditation. And, and the other note we have is gratitude. Yes. Gratitude is another practice. Mm. I love it as a daily practice. I actually created a peak potential journal that includes a daily gratitude. I call it a gratitude blossom. It looks like a little flower on each page. And there's a spot just to write three or four things that you're grateful for. And I find that to be an awesome way to start the day, just reminding us that there's always something to be thankful for. And it does help set the tone. Yeah. But especially in the world we live in today, we were, ta we were talking before we got started that, you know, I, I asked if you were a news junkie and, and I'm not, and you're not. And I think, you know, it's great that we have the ability to share information and get information quickly. But I also think that it's so easy to just for people just to flip that on or turn on their phone and look at the, the whatever the feed is that they're getting, whatever they're feeding on. Uh, and some people it's, you know, it's network news and some people it's, you know, Instagram or, or whatever you're following, because we have that ability to start to fine tune. And many of us do, right? There are a lot of people who get up and set intention for the day. And I love the gratitude practice. You know, what am I? Because we can find so many things to be grateful for. One of the things I try and integrate into my morning is as soon as I open my eyes, I try and remind myself how grateful I am for the the ability to see. Mm -hmm. Right? Oh, the sun is up. Or, Absolutely. And there are just you, you could you could probably find fifteen things in the first two minutes to be grateful for if we didn't let our minds get in the way. Exactly. And, and start to go, oh, okay, what do I have to do today? And what's necessary? And, right. Oh my God, am I ever going to get all that done? Mm -hmm. And how might that change your path for the day? You know, if you're able to take a few minutes and do that. Mm -hmm. We have a family tradition. Every family dinner, we sit down and we just start with, we go around the table and what is everybody grateful for? Yeah. So, you know, we try and start the day in our journal and then wrap it up to towards the end of the day with another gratitude practice. I want to come live in your house. Yeah. <laughs> You're welcome anytime. <laughs> you. That's number one. Oh, and I don't know, are these in any, these aren't really in any particular order. They're not in any particular order. And I think they all, they all interplay on each other. So it's kind of a circle of fun. Uh, the next one, there's a, a note next to it. And this is off your website that, you know, exercise is optional. Movement is essential. Yes, I think we've become very focused on exercise in our society when movement really is what matters. And there are so many different types of movement. And I think there's an association between exercise and pain. It's more like um, pain driven, you know, if it doesn't hurt enough, if it's no pain, not, no gain. Right, no pain, no gain. Where movement, I think for some people, can be perceived as enjoyable right? and not that exercise can't be enjoyable. Um, it's how we look at it. But I think, you know, there's this, this pressure to go to an exercise class. There's right. pressure to go to the gym. There's pressure to do these maybe higher level um, types of, of movement that aren't necessarily enjoyable for everybody. And I think what matters is that you find that thing that you love and the people that seem to get the most benefit out of movement are those that find something that they truly enjoy um, or, you know, well-rounded 
type of different movements that yeah. they enjoy. And, you know, I think we were, we were designed to move. We had to jump, crawl, sprint, yeah. walk long distances years and years ago just to survive. We had to hunt for our food, gather our food, build our shelters, you know, keep ourselves from being eaten. And so our body loves that stimulation. If we can provide it in a way that isn't intimidating or isn't overwhelming and find some joy in that. So, you know, today we don't have to do all those things to survive, but we can kind of to jump in and find those that just bring us in our physical body a sense of well-being. Yeah. The body, right? What feels good in the body then in turn feels good and then the mind feels better, right? Absolutely. And I'm going to, these, these all do connect, right? This interconnected vessel that we get to roll with, right? And how do we, how do we pilot this ship? Right. I, I think the, for me, one of the really interesting things, I'm a very focused, like I'm a, I have a, a rather addictive personality. And so I can focus on water skiing and everything in it that it's going to take to really perform at a high level, or I can get ready for a telemark ski season and do a certain thing. I can go just as deeply into yoga, which is kind of where I am now. And as you're talking, I'm like, I haven't really gotten any real exercise in a while, but you know, it feels good to be practicing yoga. And I think we sometimes need to allow ourselves to, it's not always going to be the same. What once was great, you know, when you were a gymnast and when I was a ski jumper, I don't want to go out and do 200 plyometrics this afternoon because I would not be walking tomorrow, right? Like I'd be done, but I could probably go out and do 20 and feel pretty good about it. Right. So, you know, modifying. And then I think the other thing where we tie mind and body back in together is again, how do I feel today? Yeah. Because you're not always feeling the same, right? Depends on how we rested and we'll get to that, right? Like because it all ties together, if we're listening and we're, we're paying attention, we're not then beating ourselves up because today we don't feel as good moving as we did yesterday or a week ago. You know, maybe we're fighting off a little bug or maybe we didn't eat as well or maybe we didn't get as much sleep. And so being kind to ourselves and not hammering away and in turn creating anxiety or what have you, right? So a little bit of flexibility, I think, in our movement practices and our exercise practices give ourselves a little more latitude we're our own worst critics are we not we are for sure yeah i think you're absolutely right i think the skill of being aware of your state and where you're at is challenging it's Mm. hard but you can it's fun to get better at it and that awareness of where is my body today what makes the most sense for me to do in terms of movement will help you get the most out of it so it could just be a walk around the neighborhood. It could be a few push-ups and squats, you know, in the middle of working at your desk for the day, you get up a couple times and you do that. Or if you're feeling really good and really rested and you want to go out and push a little bit, then that might be the day to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, I think why I've experienced many ebb and flows when it comes to movement and exercise throughout my career, even in the CrossFit world, I went you know, pretty hard at it for a while. And then my body broke down and needed a rest. And so I had to take that. I had to focus on, on other things outside of the gym. And then once I felt ready, bring myself back to the gym. But even today, I approach those workouts very differently than I did, say, 10 years ago. Right, right. Yes. The things that we learn. Yes. Right. If we, if we knew then what we know now. Yeah. Yeah. We would do things differently, or maybe we wouldn't, right? Not always. Not always. Right? Not yep. always. Yep. I, I think that's another thing. It's really easy for us to go back and say, oh, if I did know then what I know now, I'd have done that differently, but we didn't. Right. And and I had a long conversation with a good friend of mine the other night, and we were talking about ski jumping in an 18-year career. And did I do it perfectly? No. Right? Was I focused on some other things as well as ski jumping? Yes but I thoroughly enjoyed it, right? The ups and the downs and the, and the, the victories and the defeats and the, you know, the, ah, the highs and the lows and all the pieces that come along with it. And I, I've said for years, like, I don't think I would change a thing. I could have gone further athletically or achieved more better results or something like that. But I use that analogy or that, that example because I think we can, sometimes we can beat ourselves up for shit that we can't change. Absolutely. I think that process is critical and enjoying that process is something that I'm really passionate about. 
something I'm grateful for that I was able to do as well as a gymnast. And, you know, I think that that's how you learn. That's, you have to kind of go through those, those ups <laughs> and downs um, to learn. And I think if you can appreciate that, then you're going to come out on the other side, still charging, still ready to right. embrace what's going to come. Right. Yeah. And, and take forward what yeah. we've learned, yeah. right? Um, food is our life force. And I know you're very passionate about this recipes. That's where Primal Peak started with recipes and nutrition and and coaching people. Love to hear your take, especially in the world we live in today where it's, oh, it's gotta be this, or it's gotta be, you have to eat this, or it has to be vegan or vegetarian or something, something, something. We'll call it whatever you want, right? Yep. I love to set all the buzzwords aside when possible. We hear them constantly these days. Uh, and I like to think about where food should come from. And we lived off the land for how many thousands of years. And yes, our land is different today. So there are some more challenges to that. But I think keeping that concept in mind of what the earth naturally provides or the foods that are sourced closest to the earth is just a great base to start from. And you know, you, you bring up different diet types. There are more and more of them out there and some kind of fade away. Others hold strong for a while. But I think one thing we tend to do is focus on their differences rather than their commonalities. Mm -hmm. So I really love to think about what's the same across them all or what is similar across them all, these different styles, different approaches to food, and how can we celebrate that? And look at what I see in those similarities is nutrients, nutrient density, and trying to get the most we can out of the food. So rather than thinking about calories, rather than counting macros, which there's some benefit for people who are working on performance, we'll say whether it's performance sports or they have a specific goals in mind, there's, there's a time and place for it. But I think when we kind of set the calories and the percentages aside and we look at how can we get the most vitamins and minerals and antioxidants and phytonutrients from our food? Then again, we're celebrating whole food. We're celebrating real food. We're trying to bring more of that into our diet, put more of those items on our plate. We're celebrating color. And we are automatically, by focusing on those things, you are reducing the amount of processed ingredients that come into your diet or the sh excess of sugar that's working its way in. And I think those are the biggest inflammatory items that we're coming across today. What are the most inflammatory items? I think it's sugar and it's processed oils. Mm -hmm. Those would be my two number one. You know, if you think about box packaged, very processed foods, they're typically full of those things. Right. Um, and, it, you know, I have another concept that I use all the time, which is that we can't outsmart nature. And I, that applies to food as well. So we try and we'll keep trying probably, but usually when man really gets in there and disrupts things, it, it changes the system. It changes the natural, the natural way. And it tends to lead to the diseases that we're seeing today, the chronic health issues that tend to come from food or other lifestyle habits. But oftentimes there's a, there's a big food component there for sure. To what does nature provide, right? We can't all be out grubbing around in the woods for no. our food. We know that. Right. Doesn't, you know, I think sometimes it's, there's a presentation of information that can be very dogmatic. And, and I think that can be intimidating it, equally, if not more intimidating than something like meditation. Like, yes. oh my gosh, what do I eat? What should I be doing? Yeah. Right. Maybe we, we can stop shooting on ourselves, right? What can I do? What is available? And I have a saying that, you know, I try not to let perfection get in the way of good enough, right? Because we can beat ourselves up just trying to get everything right. Absolutely perfect. And, you know, we make mistakes and we, and we can't eat perfectly all the time. So getting back to nature, um, I did want to, have you seen the movie Need to Grow? No. It's worth mentioning. It's a fascinating film. I won't say too much more about that. I'd, I'd love at some point to see if I can get those people on the on the ATBS the podcast. But really, you know, again, back to the earth. How are we growing it? What kind of nutrients are we getting? Right, that nutrient density. 
eating the rainbow. At least I, I'm hearing some things from you. You know, we we try not to put labels on things, but e things that are easy to remember. Yeah. Right. I had Rich Hamilton on the other day, and we were talking about the epigenetics of nutrition, and you know, talking about shopping the the perimeter of the grocery store. And and one of the things that he brought up, and I'd love to hear your take on this because I know you work at as a nutritionist at Copper Moose Farms here, right up the road. And his idea was, you know, every time he goes to the grocery store and goes into the produce section, he finds something that he's unfamiliar with. Yep. And he brings it home and figures out how to cook it. Yep. And it, that's intimidating too. I look around, I'm like, what the heck do you do with that? And maybe have a recipe before you go, maybe go to primalpeak.com and get a recipe before you go to the, before you go to the grocery store and pick up something that's different. You know, when we start talking about our microbiome and we don't want it to be a monoculture, right? right? Uh, I tend to get, as I said earlier, I have a very addictive personality. I like to eat the same breakfast and I like to eat the same this. And I feel, I'm like, okay, well, that's really good. And I think it's good for me, but it can also be limiting where, you know, we want a rainforest of in our microbiome. We don't want a monocrop, right. right? Yes. I think when we were hunter and gatherers and we were living more off the land, you know, sometimes we think, well, that was somewhat of a limited diet and in certain areas, it could have been absolutely. But from what I understand, there was actually quite a bit more diversity in our diet than we realized. So the number of plants that we were eating and that were out there that we may not even have today, those, a lot of those plants have died off. We don't, you we know, don't even know, we don't have access to those anymore. Yeah. Um, and so the diversity in food, I think is so important for our gut and for our microbiome. I think, you know, we, we there are gut issues out there today. So mm -hmm. sure, certain people can deal with certain foods better than others. But I think the goal ultimately is to try and find as diverse a diet as we can. So the different colors in foods offer different types of nutrients, the different textures, the different levels of bitterness, different levels of natural sweetness. There are nutrients in there that are, are representing those mm. tastes or those textures or those colors. And so the diversity is critical. And that technique you mentioned about finding something new in the produce section. That's something I use too with my clients or write about giving parents that advice for trying to educate or expose their children to new foods, new vegetables, especially, and let them be the ones that go out and find in the produce section or at the farmer's market, a new vegetable or a new fruit. Let your, let your kids before. go find let it. Let your kids go find yeah. it and then bring that food back and together find out how you're going to cook it, how you're going to prepare it and involve them. Because I think kids too love the mystery. They love the adventure in anything. Mm -hmm. So if you can make it fun, make food exciting, then they're going to be that much more apt to eat it. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a really nice segue. We're going to go into within Primal Peak, the project that you're working on right now, right? Like parents and kids and, and food and recipes, I'll let you speak to it. Yeah, I'm working on an ebook that will be out there soon, um, encouraging kids and families to get in the kitchen more. So it'll be called Kids in the Kitchen. And it's really, it's, I'm passionate about it for a lot of reasons. I think it's a great concept, not only for health and nutrition, but also for time together as a family and also for giving kids more competence when it comes to food and when it comes to taking care of themselves. So it's a skill that has become somewhat of a lost art. And I want to bring that back. I know I could have benefited from it for yeah. sure. Right? <laughs> I had to teach myself later in life. Right. And if, you, if you've got some, because you know, you know, kids are going to grow up, they're going to move out of the house and, and they're going to get out there and, and uh, preferably not be rolling down the street to McDonald's to, you know, get calories, right? Uh, exactly. Yeah. I have a section in there. There's a recipe section. And the idea with the recipe section is to give kids the tools that when they leave the house, they can take care of themselves yeah, nutritionally. Right. And it's, you know, I try to keep it pretty basic, but yet there's awesome flavor in there. There's different techniques in there. It's just exposing them to things that they can learn and that they can do. It just takes a little bit of time and making it a priority as a family. But I think the benefit to that is it's just invaluable. 
Like I'm thinking about kids in the kitchen I'm thinking about them growing up and going out into the world. And what better than to have some skills in the kitchen that you can share with other people. So, you know, much of it, as you know, is focused around the family because you've got boys that are in the house and, and then they're going to go out into the world in the not too distant future. And, you know, one of your other pillars is people. Yes. And face-to-face -face communication and actually sharing experiences with others that could be in the kitchen. And so the boys go off and invite, you know, whomever and have some experiences in the kitchen. So I'm jumping a little bit, but let's go to people. As you said, it's that the face to face that we're often missing today. I think we feel connected, uh, cooking, being in the kitchen. That is something that like you're directly sharing with somebody. So when it, my philosophy around food is that it should unite people. It should bring not just your family together, but your friends together. It should bring the community together. One cool thing they do at Copper Moose Farm from time to time in other places is bring the community together around a great meal. And actually years ago when it was um, smaller in size, those that attended the dinner would go harvest some of the food first and bring it back to the kitchen and help prepare the meal. That's fantastic. Super cool, right? Right. So being able to gather around food and share that with others is, I mean, really doesn't get much better than that. We're nurturing our mind, body, and spirit all at the same time. Yeah. Yes, with that connection. That's our fourth pillar that we're talking about. And, you know, body language, facial expressions, tone of voice, really what we're saying is 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 not the first piece of the puzzle right it's how we look and how we interact and and we don't get that from electronics right there's that component that's missing here we are in the pod ship today at atbs and and it's the first day that we're actually recording we're videoing and um, so we'll see how that goes but i think part of that is as this gets up and running people want to see like they're going to want to see Shannon Doliak and and see your smile and see your passion and and for all of these things and and it makes a difference, right? Sadly, you can't be in everybody's kitchen, but your kitchen can be in everybody else's kitchen through Primal Peak and and your ideas and thoughts and and certainly we're going to get things out there as best we can. So I know I threw us off a little bit by going. So we've gone mind, body, food, people. Then let's maybe jump back to nature and you know, some of these ideas and well, I'd love to hear your ideas. Yeah. I think it's very easy to isolate ourselves from nature today. If you think about we're living in insulated homes, then often we're, well, we're putting on shoes and walking to a garage often, getting in our car, driving to work, sitting in an office. There's not a lot of connection to nature in many people's day-to-day -day life. Right. And that connection is we were we were born into nature. We live, we are a part of nature. And the energy that we can get from nature can be very healing. It can be very energetic. And uh, I think it also brings out an appreciation for the natural world mm. that we're partly missing today. Um, I think there's a drive. People are realizing that it's important and that we're, you know, we're kind of missing it. We need to bring that back. Um, but it, it's true. I mean, we definitely have disconnected. And there's so many interesting ways to, to connect. Yeah. I, a couple of things come to mind while you're talking about it. I think last night was a super moon and in lots of parts of the world, partly weather, partly maybe, you know, clouds and, and um, pollution can shield that from us. It's still there, mm -hmm. right? It's one of those things where even if we can't see it, or it's like an eclipse that happens when you can't see it, it's below the horizon. It's still happening. It still has an effect on us, right? So the full moon, my goodness, it moves the oceans. I'm certain it moves us. Right. Another thought that I had as you were talking about, you know, moving from the house into the garage, into the car, we're not touching the earth with our feet. We're not grounded and, and feeling that very definitely scientifically, and I'm not a scientist, but, but there is energy coming out of this earth. Pachamama is exuding energy and we most people i think not intentionally are shielded from that right right and so walking outside and taking the shoes off and 
I was talking to a friend of mine who's got some foot problems and, and she was saying that her doctor said, well, don't ever walk barefoot. Right. It's bad for you. And I just was, oh no. Now I get it, you know, if there's some structural stuff, but, but boy, you know, putting your feet in the dirt or the sand or, or the grass yes. and, and spending some time there. Yeah. I think too, as kids, any parents that are out there, if you have kids, then encourage that from a young age. So you think about taking your shoes off and walking in the dirt, walking in the grass, you know, even just climbing over rocks with those bare feet, you're going to hopefully develop the movement patterns in the muscles to support that. I think that some of us that haven't done that and we get into our adult years, when we take our shoes off, it is harder to adjust. Not that we're not receiving benefits still, but in terms of foot pain, you know, if we can get our little ones used to that idea when they are itty bitty, then that's going to help them develop. 26 bones in each foot. And I think 31 muscles, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. I think of all the articulation that's happening in your feet. Yes. And, and when you put them in shoes, you know, my, one of my daughters calls them the, the, the shoe vices or the, the foot vices or something like she hates having shoes on. But, you know, when we're not really articulating our feet, they get balled up and then we get all kinds of things going on. Right. So I think there's great benefit to, to getting barefoot when you can. Right. And, and part of that is just walking barefoot in the house to start with, right. On a, on an even floor, but feel what it feels like. Right. And then, and then take it outside. I'm going to have an opportunity to spend some time with nature coming up in about seven days which you're familiar with. And, and I invited both you and Mike to come and, and I understand that it doesn't work, but um, 21 days on the Colorado river going through the grand Canyon. And I know I'm fortunate. I, I get that, but what an opportunity to plug in not only to nature, but to the energy of this planet and, you know, the combination of a moving river and the flow of the river and, and one of the wonders of the world and, and sleeping out. Somebody said to me the other day, I was, I'm the, I'm the trip leader and the permit holder. So lots of questions coming my way. Yes. Right? And one uh, person said, I think it was yesterday said, well, I'm thinking I'm going to sleep on the boat because and I think there was kind of a, a critter mm. aversion. Yep. Like, I think I'll leave, I'll sleep on the boat. And she had gotten that idea, I think from, uh, from a commercial river rafting guide. Because when you're running down the river as a commercial guide and there are 30 people on the boat, it's just as easy just to go crash on the boat and not have to set up tents because you got to get up and cook in the morning. Then I said to her, I said, you know, it's kind of loud and it bounces around and the water laps against the raft and the tide, there is a tide in the Colorado because of the releases from Glen Canyon Dam. And I said, so, you know, sometimes people wake up and the raft has listed because the, the water's dropped. And for me, I want to sleep on the ground. Yes. And I want to sleep on the ground for exactly the reasons we're talking about, right? 21 days of connection to this, this earth that we're, gravity is holding us on, thankfully. And um, I know it's a privilege to do it, but I, I really look forward to the, the healing that occurs when one has an opportunity like that. And, you know, you can go camp out in the backyard. Absolutely. Right? You can go sleep on the ground. You can sleep in an igloo if you want. That's right. <laughs> it's the Doliacs yeah. do periodically. Right. I think you can feel the benefit even when you're out on a short hike, even when you're, like you said, camping in the backyard, it's calming, it's rejuvenating. I know our family always comes back home feeling refreshed and rejuvenated. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot to be said. There's a lot of good happening in the outdoors, right? We can get caught up in the things that aren't so good, but it doesn't, you don't have to go too far and walking out into the woods to really feel it, right? Right, And hear it. And uh, so now I've jumped around on the list a little bit. Um, play, we're talking about kids and and how to, you know, we can, we can learn a lot of lessons from kids, can we not? Yes. If you just watch them and you watch them go skipping down the street or or curious about something, they jump in and they just get it. You know, kids jump into puddles and things like that. Yeah. You know, play is often thought of as childish and, and you know, it is and we all ought to be spending a little bit more time in a childish way, I think. Absolutely. If kids come home from school and the first thing they want to do, the first thing is out of their mouth is, can I go play? And, you know, you ask them, what do you want to do? I don't know. I just want to go play. You know, they don't have an agenda. <laughs> right. They want to go have fun. They want to just explore. They want to see what's out there. They want to use their imagination. They want to be creative and they just want to be. And I think we need more of that. We, 
as adults tend to have probably too much of an agenda at times. Well, in the structure of school, right? Both of the boys are in school, so there's a lot of structure. And that can be, you know, then they come home and want to flex a little bit, right? Get out of the box a little yeah, bit. They do. And the joy, the laughter that you see on kids' faces when they're really immersed in play is awesome. It's like, I want some of that, you know, and that laughter is something that is healing. It is very important in our health, our overall health. So I always recommend to adults, like, just make a short list of things that you really enjoy that have the impact doesn't matter or the outcome doesn't matter, right? Like the end doesn't, there's no- There's no goal, like goalless goal exploration. All. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and sometimes it helps adults, I think, to play with kids to start just to to go back and remember, oh, what is it like? To like, be reminded. Yeah, be oh, reminded. This is how they do it. Exactly. Or this is how we can do it. Yeah. In ATBS podship world, it's probably 1115 or 1120 or something like that. You've gone out and you've worked out. Do you schedule playtime? Like, do you try and say, okay, I'm going to spend a little bit of time today. How do you do it so that not, not what do you do for play, but how do you, how do you make sure there's room for it or time for it? Yeah. For me, um, creativity is just, is what comes to mind. It's making sure that I have time for that creative expression. And that can look very different for me day to day, what that is. It could be in the kitchen. It could be coloring. It could be, um, you know, playing with the kids or, or something like that, where it's just very free. So the seven pillars play being one of them are things that I think about every day. And so I'm reminding myself, am I touching on each of those seven pillars? Am I getting any play? You know, it could even be playing with the pets. It could be playing a board game at the end of the night. And so I do have to, I have to have that reminder there or else it easily is forgotten. If people, I, I look over at my desk over here and I've got some, um, some sticky notes up, right? Yeah. And we can get so focused on the things that we need to do. And, and, you know, uh, when we're done, I'm going to put up a sticky note that says play and, and I'll figure out what that'll be today because this is partly play for me, but, and I hope that that's it, what it ends up being is, is, oh no, this is good. Like we're, we're exploring and covering some new ground and opening some doors and turning on some lights for people, but, but really just free form play is what we're talking about and turn the analytical mind off and who cares what you look like. And right. Even just my own experience, sometimes I'm hesitant to play or go do things, say a uh, wiffle ball game in the backyard with right. the kids. It's like, ah, oh, but I, I should be doing this instead. Or, and then if I commit to it and I'm out there, there's nothing that feels better than that. When you like really jump in and, you know, actually set everything aside. Run those you, bases. Yeah. Hit that it's ball. Like, so fun. <laughs> and And then you feel better heading back to whatever it is on your to-do list. Yeah. yeah. And it doesn't have to be that long, no, right? It doesn't. That's one of those things about, you know, I think people think about it in terms of going back to exercise or movement, that it has to be a certain amount of time or play has to be a certain amount of time. If you just touch on things, a little bit of mindfulness, a little bit of meditation, a little bit of deep breathing, and it can seem overwhelming. Like we're going to come to the, I think we've covered six, mind, body, food, nature, play, people, and interaction with people. And and then we're going to need to rest. Yes. Number seven. Yes. Rest is hard. Not in this order, but. Right. Yeah. They're all could be in any order. Um, rest is hard because we often have to say no to something in today's world in order to give ourselves that time to truly rest. And rest looks and take different forms. So we often think of sleep and sleep, of course, is important, not just quantity, but quality, but so is downtime in general. So rest and recovery could be reading a good book, could be having a cup of tea in the middle of the afternoon and, and taking those deep breaths that we mm -hmm. talked about when we talked about meditation. It's letting the body recover and repair. And I think we forget that that's really critical. So you can work yourself really hard. And yet if you're not giving your body that time to repair and recover, then you're just digging a deep hole. The deeper the hole, the harder the steps to get out. It seems like, I think when you say that, I think of somebody who's dug such a big hole that, you know, they look up and they're like, how do I get out of here? Right. And it can seem overwhelming. I imagine, right. Sometimes I feel that way. And I think we probably all do at different times, but 
if you can just take a step. One of the, I told you about a, a, an episode we did the other day with um, Chris Fisher. Yes. He had so much reverence for his parents, which was really, really enjoyable to hear. And his dad was a really astute businessman and, and Chris was in the business with him for years. And one of his dad's favorite sayings was, and Chris shared it, so, and I like it a lot, so I'm going to pilfer it. An inch is a cinch, a yard is hard, mm-hmm. right? It's not that difficult to sit down and have a cup of tea. You might give yourself 10 minutes right. or, and, and read a little book, not the news, right? Not, not, you know, go away from the cortisol yep. and sip from the, the serotonin and the melatonin cup a little bit and give ourselves that opportunity to heal and recover and rebuild, rejuvenate, and not just physically, but mentally and emotionally, right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, taking that time of stillness, that's how I like to think of it often. And I do think we get wrapped up in it's the end of the day that we're going to rest, but incorporating those little inches into the day, I think is really important too. And even using, again, when we're talking about the interconnectedness of the seven pillars, using food to help you rest and recover, right? Nourishing your gut, nourishing your physical self is part of that recovery. Um, And also the foods that you eat are going to impact how well you sleep at night. There are a lot of a lot of things that you can do. And I think it's great to just maybe start with picking a couple of them. And again, bring it back to that awareness. Awareness of rest is important. I'd like to incorporate more rest into my being. And how can I change a couple habits or tweak a couple habits so that that's possible? See how I feel. What's the difference? Another good friend of mine who's a chiropractor that I used to ski jump with, his name's Chris Hastings. And and as many chiropractors do, his practice has morphed and he's added different healing modalities and things like that. And so for the last 15 or 20 years, I, you know, we talk every six months or something. And early on, I, I would say like, so what's your, like, what do you got? Health and wellness, what, what are you thinking? And he said a couple of things, but one was, you know, if you're going to make a change, make a change that you can do 90% of the time. And you know, that, so it's gotta be something that you're going to be able to stick to, right? It doesn't have to be a wholesale change. And I think within these seven pillars that we're talking about, it can be again, kind of overwhelming. Oh my gosh, how am I going to do all those things? But if, if we were to just make enough of a change, just an inch and something that we can integrate daily, right. And maybe just say, oh, well, I really like this tea and I'm going to have a cup of tea at 1030 in the morning. And I'm going to give myself a little moment to take those 10 deep breaths, find something in, and don't make the wholesale change that you're going to do for 10 days and then stop. Yes. Cause that doesn't work. Right. This is, we're really talking lifestyle here. Absolutely. We're not talking diet. We're not talking CrossFit. We're not talking a particular, anything specific. We are talking about lifestyle. Yes. Right. Yeah. Really bringing an awareness again. I just, I love that word. So it comes up quite a bit, but it's starting out that way. And, you know, when I work with nutrition clients, we talk about that a lot. Like the first step is just an awareness. I don't even necessarily want people to go out and make a change right away. It's noticing what your habits currently are and maybe what you could easily change and incorporate to make it stick or to make some progress, some improvement. I think we talked last time too about the hallway with all the different doors. You're looking down a long hallway in there you know, doors down it and bringing awareness to different aspects of life is pretty cool. And we have a lot of that opportunity these days, but it can also be overwhelming when there are so many doors and how do you know which one to open? How do you know which one to go into? You can't choose them all. We just don't have that capacity. And so I think the seven pillars help me to remind myself, I want to touch on those every day. I want to remember that in my mind, those are the basic tenets of life, right? And and then if I have space to explore a little bit further or open a different door, I can do that. You know, I think it's bringing it back to these basics of, I like to use the word wealth, which in my mind is a combination of health and wellness. So, you know, finding your fullest wealth, we just get easily overwhelmed 
And it's nice to be able to bring it back to something very basic. I think a lot about time too in my mind and how we don't have time to meditate. We don't have time to eat well. We don't have time to exercise. We don't have time to enjoy the people around us. We don't have time to rest, right? We can't sleep at night. We have to push and and get that work done. We don't have time to go out and hike. But then I have to ask myself, if we don't have time for any of that, what are we spending our time on? Yeah, what are we doing? What are we doing? And is it worth it? Are we really, you know, living our, our peak potential? Are we living to our fullest capacity um, if we're not feeling fulfilled and we're not feeling feeling well. I think it brings that for me, as you're saying that, it brings it back to, you know, these are the seven pillars of peak performance. And you started out right off the bat talking about what well, we've we talked about being present, mm-hmm. right? And and we can get so caught up in in feeling about feeling all the things that we need to do and focusing outwardly mm-hmm. and not being in touch with ourselves. And not then bringing the best version our, of ourselves to the game of life. Right. And that's really what we're talking. I think that's, for me, that's my takeaway is like, look, this is a, this life is, we know it's tenuous. Uh, we know it's fragile. Under the very best of circumstances, it it's not a long run. My dad died at 92 years old last May. And I think, I'm sure he would have said, wow, that, that was pretty quick. And that's a good, that's a long life, Right bringing our, the best version of ourselves to the day, yeah. to the moment for ourselves. And then if we can do that, we exude such great energy, right? To those around us and we can elevate, we can lift others up. It's, and I think that Primal Peak, the project and all that w- is within it, and you can find it at primalpeak.com and, and you can find the, all of these things that have been talked about, the journaling and the recipes and the seven pillars. It's, it, it's a deep well of information that, you know, ATBS, the podcast, it's what we're trying to, what I'm, my intention is to turn some lights on, right? Some of those doorways that maybe for people haven't had labels and haven't had lights on and maybe hasn't been any awareness of them. And at the end of the day, I just think we're trying to bring a better, the best version of ourselves to the party. Yeah. And that to me is what the seven pillars of peak performance are all about. It's the word peak performance, I think sometimes can be taken as, you know, I have to be an athlete or I have to be, you know, driving towards some accomplishment to tune into that. And really it's about putting our best foot forward. It's being the best version of ourselves considering where we're at at the moment too. So, you know, it could be, you might be struggling at the moment, but being able to put yourself in the best position on that day, that's what these seven pillars are all about. And I think we spend a lot of time on trying to accomplish these days and we're missing out on being. Mm. So it's great to accomplish, right? But if you're not enjoying the process and you're not remembering to be in that process, then What are we doing? Yeah, what's the point? (laughs) Like, what's the point? Yeah. As an athlete, I know it's not the accomplishments or the accolades that I remember most. You know, it was the people, it was the process of the challenge of training for being the best I could be as a gymnast that I loved and that I will always remember. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was a successful gymnast, but I don't remember my scores. I don't remember what meets I, you know, place first on beam or first in the all around, all that's gone. Right. You know, it's the the memories of the people and the, the full experience that's last. And then you get to bring that, yeah, I mean, you get to bring that to your to your game every day, the game of life. Right. Right. You get to take that to the gym. You get to be that as mom and as as a wonderful wife and and community member. Mm-hmm. Right. That's that's really it. I really appreciate you going back to the the peak performance piece because I believe people can feel that like, oh, well, I'm not an athlete. Well, we all are, right? And we, the, just being in this world and, and being physical, having this human experience in these physical bodies is, oh yeah, we are all athletes. We should move and we should take good care of ourselves. So Shannon Doliak, I appreciate you coming to the pod ship and I appreciate you allowing me to turn the cameras on today for the very first time. So remember that uh, primalpeak.com is where you can find Shannon. And she provides all kinds of 
all kinds of information. The, the, the well is extremely deep. I've been in the website, I've looked around and, and I've barely scratched the surface. What are you excited about doing today when you leave the pod ship? It's a rather nice day in the mountains. What are you excited about? Yeah, it is a beautiful day. Um, Got to get the dogs outside for my little moment of connection there to nature and working on this Kids in the Kitchen project. Super excited to continue bringing that to life and helping to inspire people. You do. You've inspired me, Shannon. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you for listening to ATBS, the podcast, all things big and small. And a big thank you to Shannon Doliak today for sharing her seven pillars of peak performance, which is only a small part of her whole program on primalpeak.com. You can also follow her. She's got a great Instagram account, puts lots of great things up there at Primal Peak. So thank you, Shannon. And I'm sure that won't be the last time we have a conversation with her. Program notes and episode notes can be found at atbsthepodcast.com. And that's where you can contribute and support our podcast and what we're doing here. So thank you for listening. And we'll come back with some more great episodes. In fact, I recorded another really good one this morning. I'm very excited about. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Hey,